Well, let's focus now uh, on the situation uh, in Ukraine. We've, of course, been discussing it uh, this morning. And there are reports that Russian forces had bomba bombed an art school in Mariupol where 400 people were sheltering. According to the mayor of Mariupol, thousands of residents of the battered city have been forcibly taken to Russia. It does feel as if the news coming out of that country is just relentless at the minute. And we can speak now to one of those important voices from Ukraine. Uh, we're joined by the Deputy Prime Minister, Ola Stepanishina. Thank you so much for being on the programme. We always thank guests for coming on the show, but we are especially grateful to you. We, of course, can't say uh, where you are in Ukraine for obvious security reasons. Um, but what can you tell us and our viewers about the reality of what's happening on the ground? Yeah, indeed, I'm here in Ukraine on a beautiful Ukrainian land. Unfortunately, many cities and parts of Ukraine are under fire and nothing left from the beauty we all just seen 25 days ago. The situation is growing more and more severe, as I've been telling for a numerous time, more than 15 days of this resistance are the resistance of Ukrainian people, Ukrainian nation, who face severe attacks. Basically, Russia has committed nearly all possible war crime uh, which the humanity has seen over the Second World War. The number of civilian victims is far more than of those from the armed forces of Ukraine. It is absolutely essential that nobody is getting used to the war. We stand, we resist, and we will go stronger regardless any attempts of the Russian Federation, which has failed so far in its majority. You say that the Russia, Russians have failed so far, but how much longer do you think Ukraine can withstand this? Well, uh, when we we're saying about the enormous bravery of Ukrainian people, Ukrainian nation, Ukrainian army and Ukrainian government, uh, it's something that we would expect from the all leaders around the world who are standing for the values enshrined in the UN Charter and uh, that's why Ukraine will resist as long as it's needed to make sure that no terror, no massive murdering, no genocide is committed on this land in the 21st century. But it is absolutely clear that an only Ukrainian army and only Ukrainian president will not be able to withstand it alone. It's really important that all political leaders around the world, from U.S. to European Union and Asia, would stay united and establish the anti-war coalition. And only these joint efforts will allow us to prevent this massive genocide and murdering in the 21st century. So far, Ukrainian president, Ukrainian army, leaves a space and a time for the world leaders to get even more united and to stop this aggression. We will stand as much as it needed. So you believe it is a genocide? I absolutely believe it, and I am a lawyer myself, and I commit myself to implementation of the decision. And recently, International Court of Justice, um, uh, International Court of Justice has issued a very concrete ruling uh, on the case of genocide of Russian Federation against Ukrainian population, and it has obliged Russian Federation to suspend military operation and refrain from any military activity on our land. Uh, we know that the words and the rulings and the orders mean nothing to the Russian Federation. But it's not something I presume or anybody else presumes. This is the reality. Putin and Kremlin are the war criminals. They commit the war crimes and they do the targeted attempts to attack Ukrainian population. And you see it by the wording on the net denazification he's using. So uh, it's not a question. It's, it's simply the reality we all face in the 21st century. Another reality, um, a group of Ukrainian MPs came to the British Parliament this week and they were speaking about what's happened to women and girls in Ukraine, um, saying that they were being raped and then executed by Russian soldiers. I mean, it's, it almost feels too terrible to talk about, but it feels very important to talk about. What are you hearing about what is happening to women and girls in Ukraine? You know, in Ukrainian government, I used to before the war, uh, run the file related to gender equality and women empowerment. And of course, the first five days of war, the horrible stories of women I've heard about those women who have been raped for, for hours and then murdered, about the men and children who have been killed, the hospital druid. Uh, my tears were 
topless, but now I have the very strong aggression to make sure that each and every military criminal who has committed this crime is held to account. That's why uh, we have more than 2,000 cases, uh, criminal cases, opened in our prosecutor's office. We have the permanent information of the International Red Cross Organization, and each and every soldier who has committed this war crime, by order or not, will be held accountable. Be sure, Russian soldiers, that we fix and see it all, and Ukrainian women will stand for each other, and we will prevail. It's incredibly inspiring to hear you talk like this. It really is. Um, President Zelensky has told Putin uh, that now is the time to talk. How hopeful are you that there could be some kind of agreement, some kind of diplomatic solution? Well, it's not, uh, it, it, it is definitely not the talking between uh, a brotherhood nation or a bigger or smaller brother. Uh, Ukraine is feeling absolutely open to any kind of talk because we stand on our values. We are backed up by each and every nation of Ukraine, each and every citizen of Ukraine, and we're united as never before. So uh, these talks may take place. Hopefully, they will lead us to some results. We're extremely happy that many of the uh, European nations like Turkey, like Israel, and, uh, and transatlantic nations like Israel and other countries has um, uh, initiated uh, and will and show the willingness to facilitate this dialogue. Of course, we utilize all of these opportunities. And jointly, I'm sure that Ukraine uh, will reach the agreement uh, on the peaceful settlement, but also will be um, uh, uh, the uh, country who will have the guarantees of its security solid, clear, and very well uh, understood to everybody, guarantees of its security, not only from Russian Federation, but from other countries who has the word to say in, uh, in that situation. What could an agreement look like? It feels as if there could be some movement on NATO. Would Ukraine be prepared to give up some territory to Russia? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, Ukrainian territory is a territory which has been fixed in, in 1991 within its entirety and uh, internationally recognized border. It's not only the position of Ukraine, it's the position of the whole world enshrined in the numerous decisions of the UN Security Council, including Security Council, where the Russia is was standing. So it's not an option for it discussion, of course, there might be a room for discussion on the reintegration of those ten territories who have been under occupation for the last eight years, uh, while uh, there are like a number of the red lines, which are uh, the inexplicability to legitimize anyhow the unlawful, unprovoked military aggression on our territory. This is the red line for us. And uh, speaking of NATO, uh, as I'm leading the NATO file in the Ukrainian government, I can say that the, the, the feeling and the, uh, the political priority is still there, while the ultimate element of the agenda today is the, uh, is the ceasefire and the security guarantee. So far, NATO has not suggested anything uh, in the first and the second uh, element of these needs from our side. So uh, that's why we're looking for those options which will ensure our security and withdrawal of Russian forces from our territory. Thank you, that's very clear. And um, just finally, we've been hearing some horrific reports coming out of Mariupol. Um, shelters being bombed. The mayor says that citizens are being forcibly removed and taken to Russia. What can you tell us about what is happening in Mariupol? Uh, Mariupol is basically the, the forepost of all the tragedy and sufferings our people are facing right now. It's already for the 10th day when the Ukrainian government, with the support of the ICRC, the Red Cross Organization, and the UN are trying to facilitate this process. While Russians have tried to legitimize the evacuation of Ukrainian people to Russia and Belarus through international organization where they were blocked, and it has been um, recognized as absolutely a nonsense to evacuate people to the territory of the country who has started the aggression on Ukrainian territory. So now they do it forcefully, uh, reaching the, the level of people suffering to the, to the way that they are ready to get evacuated everywhere just to stay more or less out of this bombing and the threat of their life is less. Of course, we call on standing on the official information, official uh, sources of information from the UN 
ICRC, Ukrainian government, who provide the data on the agreed route for evacuation for Ukrainian citizens, who provide the humanitarian assistance. Please, Ukrainian people, the people of Europe, stand with us, stand for the rule of law, and do not be subjected to manipulations from Russian Federation. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, before we leave, I just want to give you the opportunity, if there's anything else that you would like to say to Western leaders, um, you're, you're the voice of Ukraine for us this morning. So what would your message be? My message would be that uh, be as brave as Ukrainians and uh, utilize each and every minute of your time while we're keeping the, the peace on your land to make sure that the aggressor and the terrorist is stopped. We deserve it as a nation, we deserve it as a people, and we all deserve it as a Europe. Thank you so much for being on the programme this morning. You're an incredibly powerful voice for your country, so it's been very important to listen to. Thank you.